Well, good afternoon, folks, and we are now into the home stretch of uh, our conference. And I hope for those of you who have uh, been here some part of the last two and a half days that the conference has lived up to your expectations. And we are going out. Thank you. Because I've got to tell you, my expectations were very, very high. And on a personal note, they have been exceeded in every single respect. And that's not only thanks to the incredible presenters uh, that have been here, to the incredible support from the audience uh, that we have received, but the people who are working the hallways, who are in the rooms across the way looking after every minute detail. This couldn't possibly have happened anywhere nearly uh, as efficiently or effectively as it has. And so if you would join me in giving a round of applause to Kim O'Brien's office and uh, everybody that has supported us through the conference. My name's Tom Martin. I'm one of the judges on our court here in the District of Kansas. And I'm not doing a full-fledged explanation or, or introduction of our next panel. But you should know who our friends are, and you should also go to the website and check out their bios, and then go to their own uh, websites and learn what extraordinary people these, uh, these folks are. Seated to my far left is Jan Carlin. Jan is the chief bankruptcy judge here in the District of Kansas and also chief judge of the bankruptcy appellate panel in the Tenth Circuit. Uh, seated directly to my left is Morgan Chu. Uh, I first saw Morgan about 18 years ago in my courtroom and he made such an impression on me that when we were putting this together, I wrote to him and asked him if he would come and then I later found out he was really a big deal. Uh, that's because I wear a bow tie. That's, that may have something to do with it. <laughs> Seated directly to my right is Rudy Pierce, who has been a friend for more than 30 years. Rudy uh, has an amazing background, both as a practitioner in Boston and as a Superior Court judge there, a U.S. Magistrate judge, back in practice in Boston and then in D.C., He's made numerous trips to South Africa to help train lawyers there and uh, is just a professional's professional. And Rudy, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Jim Eisenbrand, I think many of you know. And Jim is one of the great, great, highly respected lawyers in the greater Kansas City area and beyond. And uh, he does, as many of you know, a great deal of white-collar criminal defense work. And uh, Jim, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. And then last but not least, to my far right, is Henry Hank Meyer from Oklahoma City. And for those of you who don't know Hank or have not gotten acquainted with him during this conference, you ought to and you will. Uh, Hank is not only a tremendous lawyer, but a tremendous fella. Uh, thoughtful, pensive, and kind of a wild man at times too, which is one of the things that makes Hank uh, so wonderful. And Hank is going to moderate the panel today. Uh, and with that, Hank, I'll turn this over to you and thank you all for joining us here for this panel this afternoon. Thank you very much, Judge. The first time we went through these questions, we asked, we wanted to empower everybody out there, that's you, my brothers and sisters, to go ahead and ask questions at, during the uh, answers that were being given, and we got very, very few. So I want to make that invitation again, because instead of waiting until the end, we would prefer to answer any questions that you might specifically have of a given speaker. Uh, secondly, uh, I, we've got 
a little bit less time, so we're going to get rolling. Usually I'd ask the individual participants to give us some background. I think the judge has done that. Uh, my first question I'm going to start off will be to Mr. Morgan Chu. You've had an unbelievably successful career in dealing with juries over very complex issues in technology. I would like you to at least start off with whether or not the jury attention spent, number one, how do you take complex, difficult issues and keep them simple, stupid, so that a jury can understand? And secondly, has the attention span of jurors changed in the last 20 years? Is it less today than it was 20 years ago? I think there has been a change in terms of the average attention span. And it's not just among younger jurors, it's among all of us. And here's what's interesting. It forces all of us who try cases to think about how to present things in a shorter period of time. And if we do it well, it's actually a better presentation. So let me give you an example. And my understanding is people in this room are from different backgrounds, have different practices. So I'll give you an example of a short opening statement. It was a bright sunny day and Sally was so happy to be going to school until she got to the crosswalk at Maple Drive. And her legs will never be the same. If the lawyer sits down at that point, he or she has told the story. You notice it doesn't have all the details, but everyone is looking at Sally's legs. Everyone knows something horrible happened. They don't know the details, that it was a big black F-150 truck that came roaring through the crosswalk. They're gonna hear about all of those details later. If you can compress the message you want to give into a few lines. And Hank, with your permission, I'm going to borrow something from literature. And there's this, it's a true or maybe it's an apocryphal story. There's this fellow who loved uh, cigars and drinking and whatnot by the name of Ernest Hemingway. And he's in this famous New York bar called the Algonquin. And he's there with a bunch of other writers. And they're all good at drinking and at that time smoking Cuban cigars. So Hemingway says, I can do a novel in six words. And they drink some more, and he says, I'll bet you I can do a novel in six words. And everyone bets against him. So here's his novel in six words. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Hemingway collected the bets from all the others. <laughs> Judge Carlin, if you could maybe address, do you think the jurors are changing in other ways today? Well, I'm going to answer a different question because I don't have juries uh, okay. in my court. I'm a bankruptcy judge, and, and we, uh, we ask our district court colleagues. Uh, but what I, what I thought I would say is that what uh, Mr. Chu just said also applies to judges. Their attention spans uh, are reducing, I think, as well. Um, at least mine is. And so everything that he said about capsulizing uh, the matter in your opening or your closing uh, applies two times as much, I think, to the attention span of your judges. And I'll leave it at that. I think one of the other issues about attention span is more and more jurors are trying to keep their jobs and serve on juries. <clears throat> And you can see that uh, after a few days. You get to understand that Mrs. Smith on the back row, she was working until midnight. Now, we all kind of have this idea that you go on jury duty and your, your employer can't take it out on you uh, can't, and whatnot. But, this is happening more and more and more. 
and you have got to catch their attention because you'll see these people nodding off. Sometimes it's because they're bored with you, but a lot of times it's simply because they're tired, they're worn out, and you've got to be able to catch their attention. Judge Pierce, if, if you could address the question, do you have any definite feelings about uh, whether or not the American legal system would be better served if we did away with juries in criminal and civil cases? <coughs> well, um, I, be <coughs> I believe in juries. And uh, uh, so I'm not against um, getting rid of juries. I think to have the uh, conscience of the community in the courtroom is a good thing. And I think we just have to know how to uh, use them effectively. So I'm definitely a person who's on the side of juries. Morgan, do you have any thoughts on that issue? I do. Every judge I have heard addressing the following question gives the same answer. Here's the question. Do juries get it right? And the answer is they really do. Once in a long while, I disagree with how they came out, but a very high percentage of times, civil or criminal, federal or state courts, juries get it right. So that's a very good thing. But I don't think we can underestimate the importance the jury system plays in our overall civic life. So let me give you an example. I've tried a few cases in East Texas, and they're small towns. Dallas is not East Texas. It's Marshall. It's Texarkana. It's Beaumont. It's Tyler. When the jurors are selected, they take their position in our justice system as being very important. So first time I had a jury trial, I noticed there was a rack of blue blazers. And I asked one of the marshals, well, gee, how come all these blue blazers? He says, because the male jurors don't have jackets or suits. This is blue collar territory. But they want to get dressed up as jurors. They see their role as having an important part to play in our overall justice system. And one other little example, I was called for jury duty. I've been called for jury duty a good number of times in state, particularly in state court. And a few years ago, one of my fellow jurors who was called, so we were in this big pool, is Annette Benning. And in addition to saying, boy, that's really neat to see Annette Benning and saying hello to her and all of that, all the jurors, prospective jurors, in that big jury room say, oh, everyone's on an equal par in this courthouse. Jim, what about criminal trials? If you could address juries and criminal trials, your thoughts? Well, I mean, they're, I would, they are indispensable. I mean, without a jury, um, I have great respects for judges, but judges see the same thing day in and day out. Um, I, I, a little side note, uh, Hank, is last, uh, well, last year about this time, I heard the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Palau speak. That's a little island out in the Pacific towards Japan. He was born in the United States, uh, plays a mean rock guitar, really a mean one. Uh, but he went to Palau and became a judge and decided that the citizens of Palau needed a jury system. And so he got uh, 13, 14 prominent US lawyers and they went to Palau for a week to meet with judges uh, and other officials to teach these folks from Palau about the American jury system. So I don't think that it's dead or something that's disappearing. Trials are, and that's a different issue. But yes, uh, the, I think the uh, jury system is alive and well and will continue to be.
Morgan, if I could ask you, uh, because of the complexity, and you certainly uh, you can address e-discovery as well, and your suggestions on that, uh, have there been changes in the intensity of discovery disputes on the cases over the last 10 years that you've tried or been involved in? I think the biggest change is the fact that in almost every case, there are an enormous number of electronically stored documents. So it's emails, but it's more than emails. And so there can be literally millions and millions of documents. And in the old world, when you used to collect the physical documents and put them in a room or rooms, and then someone would have to go through and review them. But what's happened in the, particularly the last five, six years is this huge increase in efficiency. So I'll give you an example of how it's done in many of the cases I'm involved with now. We get together with opposing counsel and we agree that each side gets to pick 10 custodians of the other side after you've learned a little bit about the case. So by then, each side knows who are the important people on the other side of the case, the people who are most likely to have documents of greatest interest. And then, let's say it's our side who picked the 10. On the other side, we then give opposing counsel the word searches that we want them to run. They run the word searches, and they give us electronic copies of everything that was returned. And we do the same for them. It ends up being a very, very efficient process. Judge Pierce, if I could ask you a question to address, and that would be, does the model of billable hours have an impact on the professionalism of attorneys? <clears throat> and by the way, Judge, if you kind enough, you do serve on some ethics uh, in Massachusetts, do you not? Uh, Washington, D.C. Washington, I'm sorry. Um, well, I'm going to put this together with also on uh, what Morgan was talking about, discovery, because we are talking about professionalism, and in my view, one of the big problems in the area of professionalism relates to discovery, uh, and it relates uh, to billable hours. And, and what I mean by that is, aside from the deficiency to which Morgan referred, I think those of us who've been around a long time uh, find that it is easier to do discovery with older lawyers who've been around and much more complicated to do it with lawyers who are just starting. And that is because uh, uh, we don't get to court. Younger lawyers particularly don't get to court as much as we used to. Uh, and so there's a lot of people think the need is to fight in discovery. And so we have lots of sensible or senseless disputes. We can't seem to get to a place where we can act reasonably, we can agree with one another on the rules, and we can conduct discovery in an efficient manner. And all of that plays out in a way, of course, uh, to your client's bill. Because most in most civil lit uh, litigation, most of the money is spent in the discovery phase. And how you present that conversation to your client uh, in the billable way is a big, big problem. So uh, I, I practiced, um, the form of my practice was on the billable hour. I didn't do contingent fee work. And you know, we get these long bills. We still are one of the few businesses where our clients are not really told how much it's gonna cost them at the beginning. Most business people wanna get a budget and wanna to be told how much it's gonna be cost. We sort of say, generally it might cost this, but it may be more and then we build on a billable hour. And so your client gets a bill and they see all this stuff about discovery or they see on that bill, print out about uh, conferences amongst lawyers in the hour in, in, the, uh, in the inside the firm. Client says, what, what's, why, do, why do you need to talk to three other lawyers and bill me for it? All of those issues uh, are huge professional problems, and of course we know what the pressures are. Younger lawyers need to get billable hours. Everybody wants to make money. So how we manage that basket of issues is a huge problem, particularly as we talk about professionalism, figuring out a reasonable way to get to a point where we can be reasonable with one another 
we can find a way to build in a way that our clients will understand and we can deal with client expectations. Those are huge issues here as we're thinking about professionalism. Hank, if I can jump in on professionalism in the business of law. The biggest change during my career was the American lawyer. And what happened was the American lawyer started publishing information, some accurate, some inaccurate. This lawyer makes that much a year. This lawyer has that book of business. And lawyers who often would spend a full career at one law firm, or maybe two, are suddenly jumping from one firm to another because the financial rewards are better. So the business of law seemed to take over, or at least take a much bigger role over the last couple decades than when I first started practicing law, and necessarily seemed to push down professionalism as being important. And that's something that is so important for all of us to hang on to, to preserve, and to nurture. And just to let you know that I do what I say, I've been with one law firm my entire career. <laughs> Judge Carlin, on that vein, do you have any way to deal with, uh, on a measurement by the attorneys that appear before you uh, on whether or not you believe that attorney X or attorney Y, both of them possess he or she integrity? Is that important to you as a judge? No, oh, it's very important. It's, it's um, um, it was touched on by the last uh, panel that spoke and, and uh, in a much more colorful language than, than I have. Uh, I think it was Mr. Bartlett said that you have to make uh, deposits before you can make withdrawals, and, and that resonated with me um, in, in a big picture way. So what he was talking about, I think, um, may have been in the lawyer to lawyer context, but it's also true in the lawyer to judge context. And it's something that you know you've all heard your whole careers, which is that um, you know your reputation is what you have to sell uh, in the courtroom, and um, it's it's quite true. Um, so um, if, you, um, if you want to um, enhance your credibility, uh, you are the type that is completely straightforward with uh, the judge when the judge asks a question. Uh, and the, the, you know, your, your reputation just builds over time. And, um, and so, I don't know that I can, I, I certainly would, would never say, oh, this, this particular lawyer doesn't have any integrity. I think that's, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a, an attorney that's ever appeared to me that I would put in that category. But there are certainly those attorneys who, uh, when they tell me something, um, I am more apt to believe than if another attorney tells me something, so. If we could just go left to right, Morgan, you next, and then Judge Pierce. Well, if I, if I could just address uh, something that's, that's slightly different, but it's a takeoff on the idea of making the deposits before the withdrawal. There are different ways to think about it. And the easiest way I think about it is to build a reputation can take half a lifetime or more, and you can lose it in five minutes. And if you think about it that way, Think about everything you're doing, what you're communicating to the court, to opposing counsel, to a client, and how you conduct yourself. Judge Pierce. <clears throat> um, I joined the bar in 1970. The first week I was at the firm, I was told something that has stuck with me my whole career. It is better to be respected than to be liked. And that means your word is everything. And if you lose your word, people don't trust you. That is lawyers, judges, clients, uh, you're gonna have a very difficult time succeeding as a practitioner. So um, to me, that's everything as a lawyer. 
your reputation, your personal integrity, far more important than whether the judge likes me or whether opposing counsel likes me. The question is, do they respect me and do they sense that they can trust me? Jim, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it, it kind of leads in, I think, to uh, the issue of how, uh, how do you handle a lawyer who has acted unprofessionally, and you know it. But I started out, I'm the old man up here. No. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> when I started in 1960, Jim, 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 we're trying not to start a fight right. here, okay? <laughs> I, I was told something that, that too stuck with me, and that was, A lawyer's words is a bond. And secondly, in court, you have two friends, the judge and the other lawyer. And I think that um, one of the things we wanted to talk about was what do you do with the unprofessional lawyer? If you, if you read the model rules, you know, it doesn't leave much room that you're supposed to self-report. In fact, there are cases out there where lawyers have been cited for unethical conduct because they failed to report another lawyer. I'll expand the two friends because the court staff also counts. Uh, there was a period in my life where I was representing people who were being prosecuted by the organized crime strike force. So I think you can understand who these people were. And I finished a trial and got a, uh, an acquittal. And the assistant U.S. attorney, I, we were up by the, the bench where the court reporter was, and the court reporter was kind of cleaning up, and the prosecutor stuck out his hand and he said to me, Jim, congratulations, you got a guilty person off. The court reporter reached over, grabbed the prosecutor by his tie. Yet another and reason to have a bow tie, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, you never speak to Mr. Eisenbrandt like that in this court. That took care of that unprofessional conduct, okay? Secondly, uh, I saw Judge Milgren, I don't know if you're still in here or not, about a word being bond. Um, before he went on the bench, as most of you know, Judge Milgren was a U.S. attorney for Kansas. And I had a case in Wichita, um, a, an immigration case, and we had worked out a reasonable solution to that case. And the probation office had just come down with a horrible pre-sentence report, really urging that my client and his company really be punished harshly. And Judge Milgren, at that time I could call him Mary, showed up on the case. And he told the judge, this is the deal that we worked out, and this is why it makes sense. And I think to this day, without that, Judge Brown would have done something really harsh and something outside the agreement that we had worked out. So that's not misconduct, obviously, but that's someone keeping their word. Misconduct, this isn't a lawyer that's around here, okay? A another organized crime case. It was an arson case. The place that was uh, that burned was a tire store. 
happened to be across the street from the police office, uh, the police headquarters in this little town out in Kansas. And the driver of the truck, there was a truck at the time it exploded, the, the store exploded, between, it was parked there, between the store and the police department. And so the driver was charged with being a part of a conspiracy to block the view from the police headquarters. The driver of the truck, who wasn't my client, but the driver of the truck said, I was hauling explosives. I wouldn't have parked had I known this was going to happen. And it had a placard on it that said so. Well, we had been looking and looking and looking for the uh, records at the trucking company, and we could never find them. During trial, someone from the trucking company called the lawyer for the truck driver and said, well, you know, the FBI was out here, and they took those records. Well, of course, we didn't see those records. We didn't know they existed. So we reported that to, uh, to the judge. And of course, you know, we were making motions to dismiss and mistrial and all sorts of things. And the judge said, here's how we're gonna handle this. Pointed to the uh, assistant US attorney said, you're gonna stand in front of the jury and you're going to explain to them that the government of the United States withheld exculpatory evidence, not just from the court, not from the defense, but from you, the jurors, and you're going to apologize for it. Case over, okay? I mean, was it unprofessional? Was it in violation of the rules of conduct for prosecutors? Absolutely. But in my opinion, that took care of the problem far better than any ethics complaint could have. So I, I think that um, these stories just indicate and reinforce uh, for me, going on 49 years now in practice, those rules haven't changed. Your friends are the other side and the judge, and sometimes the staff who's willing to go to bat for you. That's what this is all about. Question. So I said, uh, that sounds like a, a great experience and justice was done. My experience is that it practically never happens. Uh, and that exculpatory evidence is withheld on a daily basis. Uh, and no prosecutor is ever embarrassed. No prosecutor is called to task, either ethically or by the judge. Uh, and it's well, I, I do not disagree with you, um, and I think where the problem comes is, I, I think that long that young prosecutors, in some ways, and, and there are some young prosecutors in here whom I know, and I'm not talking about them, but young prosecutors are like young civil litigators. They don't have the experience. They don't have the forethought. They are caught up in delivering justice and prosecuting the case. Um, and I think it's a problem. Um, and I will say in all respect, uh, I think that uh, judges should be more forceful when those types of things happen and when it becomes known. Uh, because otherwise, you know, it's going to be left up to the lawyers, and I think the judges can handle it very well. And in a very egregious case, I guess you do go to the uh, ethics people. Yes, Judge. <coughs> well, <clears throat> I, think, um, I think your question and the response puts one of the interesting issues about professionalism here. 
Um, you you kind of know when you're a prosecutor you have a duty of exculpatory evidence, just as I would hope that young lawyers in civil cases know that they have an obligation to be responsible in discovery. The question is, why doesn't it always happen? And I think, you know, unfortunately, in trial lawyering, particularly when you're young, winning becomes everything. And uh, sometimes when we think about winning, we forget our responsibilities uh, in the system. You know, when you're winning and not thinking about doing justice, uh, you know, you're, you're not carrying out your professional responsibilities. And so hopefully in a, in a meeting like this, uh, those of you who are prosecutors, uh, those of you who are civil litigants will appreciate the need to be re reasonable with one another and to be responsible. Uh, I sat as a judge for some time, and I could honestly say I am aware, as most lawyers are, that prosecutors are sometimes not forthcoming, but the rules are odd. In the federal court, the Brady rule to me was one of the most interesting things. In most state courts, most heavy, what I call murders, robberies, serious crimes are, are tried. In the state courts in Massachusetts, discovery was pretty open. When I moved to the federal court, they had a Brady rule. The Brady rule then was interpreted to mean that I didn't have to get discovery, the Brady material, until after the witness has testified. And so now it goes from judge to judge. The judge says, well, why don't you give up the discovery ahead of time? The prosecutor says, I don't have to give it up now. I don't have to give it up until the witness has testified. And you know, the answer was always, why not? Well, we're afraid because somebody will hurt the witness. And I used to say to myself, gee, we're trying robberies and homicides and all that in the state court, and we're giving discovery. We get over here in the rarefied atmosphere of the federal court, which doesn't have those kinds of cases for the most part, and then we have this sort of rule. So in some respects, the rules don't work out well, but the basic responsibility of professionalism is to remember that trials are supposed to be doing justice. It's not just do I win uh, at any cost. Judge Carlin, why don't we kind of switch this uh, to a little bit, and we'll go from left to right after you on the answer. Uh, can you please give us some advice on, let's assume that, not you, but that some judge has made uh, an erroneous <laughs> ruling that's quite evident to everybody in the courtroom, and that uh, how do you show the most respect as an attorney to a judge under those circumstances? Well, you're right. It's very hypothetical because none of the lawyers <laughs> ever, ever disagree with my rulings. But um, I'll just start off. I think sometimes the best way to express how to do something is to say how not to do something. And so I wrote an article uh, for a journal. Uh, it was supposed to be a humorous article. The reader can determine that. But um, so. It, it was the, sort of the 10 most irritating things you can say to a judge. And the, the second one, uh, which is the one I'm going to talk about, the first was reversed and remanded. Uh, but um, the, the second one was the, was the term, with all due respect. And um, <laughs> the uh, lawyers who appear in front of me now, uh, it's, it's, it's almost amusing because if an attorney who never appears in front of me uses that, everybody else in the courtroom kind of goes, <gasps> She hates that. Uh, but the, um, at the time I was writing this article, there was a Dave Barry, who, who is you know, the highest literary source that I will source, quote to you today, um, had a Mr. Language person, and, and he says, uh, what is the correct usage of the phrase with all due respect? And his answer was, it's correctly used to soften the blow when you wish to criticize someone in a diplomatic and non-judgmental manner, <laughs> such as, with all due respect, you are much worse than Hitler. Uh, <laughs> no disrespect intended, but you have the intelligence of a macaroon. So, um, you know, the Oxford Dictionary defines this as a polite formula proceeding and intended to mitigate the effect of uh, disagreement or criticism. Uh, to me, it's dog whistle. Uh, and so, uh, the first thing I will say not to do, at least in my courtroom, is to preface your disagreement with. Uh, with all due respect, because I read that as uh, that there is no respect, and if there was, it's, it's not due to you. Um, so, uh, this, the second thing I'll, I'll say, sort of on the, on the negative side, um, is 
so for example, if I have a trial that's not very complicated and I think it's more important to get a ruling out quickly than uh, you know, to write about it because it's something that nobody cares about but the two people in the room, you know, I'll, I will uh, oftentimes do oral findings of fact and conclusions of law. Um, so the other point I will make is, you know, at that point we've had a trial, you've had an uh, opening statement, you've had a closing argument, maybe you've even had a brief. Um, so after I read my findings of fact and conclusions of law into the record, that is not the time to disagree with the judge. That is not an open uh, salvo, uh, you know, what do you think about the ruling? Um, <laughs> the ruling is over. So that's the, that's the second thing I will say. Um, on the how to do it right, um, you know, my, my assumption is that um, in the question, uh, you've asked the question and the judge has uh, sustained the, um, the objection, so you're not going to get the testimony in. Um, I think a very polite uh, way to do that is simply to ask if you can make an offer of proof. Um, I heard a panelist the other day say that um, she preferred the uh, may I make a record on the issue. That seems a little more confrontational to the judge. I mean, we all know what offer of proof means. It means, you know, I'm probably going to appeal you on this, um, and, and that's what may I make a record is. But uh, it just sounds better to my ear, I guess. May I make an offer of proof? Um, if it's a really critical piece of evidence, um, first of all, I, I sort of think you would have thought about it ahead of time, and, and maybe it would have even been the topic of a motion in limine. Um, and if it had been a topic of a motion in limine, the judge will have thought about it a lot uh, before coming into trial. And, um, and so if the judge rules against you on, on a matter that's been briefed, um, it, it's probably not going to do you any good at all. But, but one thing you might be able to say, I suppose, is um, you know, if it's something that, that hasn't been the subject of a motion in limine, and it kind of came out of the blue, and you think the judge maybe just hadn't thought that that, that might come up, and that happens all the time. Um, just something like, um, you know, pulling out a book, uh, and, and if it's an evidence book, it's even better, um, and, <laughs> and just say, Judge, may I just have a minute, you know, to consult the language of, you know, the rule? Because I think that, um, I, I, I think that maybe I can persuade you, um, you know, that, that this testimony should come in. And um, I know I'm very impressed when somebody knows the rules of evidence, and um, and so that's a way to, uh, you know, to tell your judge that you have an honest disagreement. Um, and frankly, I'm thrilled if someone will point me to a subsection of a rule that I can then think about really concretely with the question that was asked. Um, so, um, and then if it's just a really incredibly important issue, uh, you know, in my court, um, it's all bench trials, so I don't have to worry about, you know, uh, prejudicing the jury. I just have to worry about prejudicing myself. Um, and um, if it's really important, you know, sometimes we will conditionally admit testimony and then allow you to brief it um, before I enter my final ruling. Um, and I can decide yes or no. So if you think it's just really important, you're certainly willing to ask me if you ha could have the opportunity to, you know, to brief that issue. And I'm thrilled to get a brief on, on any evidentiary issue. Thank you. Morgan? To tell the truth, no. <laughs> uh, in the heat of battle, in the middle of trial, there's an objection. Win or lose, I always say, thank you, Your Honor, with a big smile and sit down. And then the jury thinks I won. <laughs> and it's even better at sidebar, because the jurors can't hear what's going on. And most lawyers walk back to counsel table kind of somber faced. I'm always smiling with my head held high, so it really looks like I won. <laughs> Judge, I don't now even... can you respond to anything like that, to no. Morgan? No, no. <laughs> right. By the way, I'll adopt that, Morgan. That's a very good approach. Jim? One of the other things that bears on this uh, is the lawyer who continues to try to get the piece of evidence in that the judge has sustained every objection to. Years ago, uh, I was trying a civil, well, no, civil, yeah, civil rights case. I was representing a city, 
Uh, the police had gone into the wrong apartment and arrested this guy in the middle of the night. And there was a piece of evidence, which I can't even remember what it was, that every single time the plaintiff's lawyer started going up to that point, I would object, the judge sustained it. I had a young associate with me that I had given one of the witnesses to. And here comes the plaintiff's lawyer. And you know, you've done it a while and you can just sense, here it comes. And I, I said to her, I said, object. Nothing happened. And I, I said, I said, object. And she said, but the question's not asked yet. I said, I don't care, object. She stands up and the judge, before she even says I object, says sustained. <laughs> And in front of the jury says, you know, Mr. Jones, it's obviously, obvious to me, you have no respect for my rulings, for the other party in this case, that is unprofessional. Case over. That's simple. I should share this true story. It's in the middle of the trial, and the judge begins to ask the witness some questions. And I couldn't help myself. I stood up and said, Your Honor, I object. <laughs> she looked down at me. She smiled, didn't know quite what to say. And then Overruled. she said, Overruled. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Oh, Your Honor, I thought you'd say that. And I said that. <laughs> well, let's go to another problem. How do you individually deal? I'll start off with you, Jim. Uh, how do you deal with clients who have unreasonable expectations regarding the potential outcomes in their case and the potential costs associated with their case? And expound whether or not you use written contracts as such with your clients and the need whether or not you believe we should have written contracts with clients. Well, the latter question, there is no question that there has to be a written contract, uh, at least in Kansas and certainly in Missouri. And it's, uh, it's improper to, uh, to not have one. Uh, in the criminal side of things, the very first federal case I had, I was court appointed to represent a guy who had been in prison most of his life. Uh, he was uh, alleged to be a part of a conspiracy to smuggle heroin into the Leavenworth Penitentiary, he and another group of people. And I went up to meet him. I'd never been in federal court. I'd never been to Leavenworth. And we go back into the bowels of the prison. And I'm sitting there with this guy. And Well, what can you tell me about this? I don't know nothing. Get me off. Well, what, what about these papers here that are supposed to be code? I don't know nothing about no code. Get me off. Well. Those were his expectations, you know? So we were gonna have a trial. There's just no two ways about it. I think on the, on the civil side, managing expectations is extremely important, especially to uh, sophisticated clients because they're looking at the expense side of things. Um, with you know, the individual client, they need to have some idea of what this is going to cost on each stage of the process. And I think that you're just inviting trouble if you do not have a straightforward conversation about it. Um, and it has to be in writing. And I keep tinkering with my uh, uh, retainer agreements uh, all the time to try to uh, fit it into a new situation that has happened, trying to be more open, more explaining about what, is, what are the expectations, talking to the client on a regular basis, that means sometimes going up to the prison to talk to them, but keep them advised of what is going on so that they understand what is happening and you can manage their expectations. Judge Pierce, 
And you might, uh, do, you, do you send emails to your clients or do you send communications as well, letters, communications from the other side? Trying to be totally transparent with them. <clears throat> the first thing is in the District of Columbia, the local rules require that you have an agreement uh, to start your case. So that's just to deal with that. Um, I, I think that um, sometimes as lawyers, particularly in litigation, we see clients at their worst. That is to say, we see people who are sued and who are upset, or we see people who are mad as hell and they want to sue somebody. And so they come into your office and they come in with a lot of that anger uh, and they want things done rapidly. And so I, I, I had a little speech that I developed. Uh, most civil cases take a long time. You're in discovery. And I would say to clients when they came into my office, look, um, I think you have a case, but let me tell you how this process works. We're going to be in discovery. I'll explain that to you for some time. But you've got to understand something here in your enthusiasm. The only thing that's going to be that you're going to see month after month after month is my bill. So let's talk about your expectations. Because I, I think managing expectations is a big deal when dealing with clients. You sort of want to get their client's expectation reasonable. Now, when you say that the only thing that's going to go on for month after month is my bills, of course, there are other things going on. It's another way of saying that they're not going to see a lot of substantive change in the process for some time. We're going to be going through discovery and all that. So it follows you have to explain all that. That's all part of the process. And once you take on the case, in my judgment, yes, you have to keep client advice. I, I will say uh, it's one area where I never seem to satisfy clients completely. I would always find a client complaining I wasn't keeping them advised enough. So I tried, which is to say I tried to give re reasonable re reports and all that. So in reality, the only thing they were not getting was just my bill. I did try to give responses, but that's, that's an issue. And, I think trying to manage expectations is a big process. Thank you. Morgan. So I'm based in Los Angeles, and as is the case for uh, many states in California, one needs to have a written agreement. But I want to point out at least two aspects about the written agreements. One aspect is it not only says what we're going to do, it also says what we're not doing. It defines the scope of the work. That is very, very important. We do this with pro bono cases as well, because sometimes a client begins to look to you to be their mother, their father, and a whole host of other things. The other is that if you are representing more than one person, let's say a corporation was sued and two of the officers were also named as defendants, there has to be some provision that addresses what happens if there is a real potential conflict that arises in the future. You don't know about that potential conflict now, but you want to be able to, what we usually do is say, we're going to continue representing the corporation. If we think there's a conflict, we're going to let you know about that immediately, and if it can't be waived or shouldn't be waived, then you're going to have to get your own separate representation, and we will continue to represent the corporation. So it's always good practice to have a written agreement. It's also good to think about the exact scope of the work and then potential conflicts down the line. In terms of estimates for what something's going to cost, I think that's incredibly important. And it's incredibly important to update it with great frequency. Uh, even when a client hasn't asked, we want to give an estimate. We think that the spend this next quarter is going to be this amount. Here's why. But there's one aspect that some clients, even very sophisticated clients, do not focus upon. They focus upon usually the amount of fees that will be paid and perhaps the costs for expert witnesses and the like. But they tend to ignore another huge cost. And that is, we're going to need your time. And we're going to need the time of key engineers at this company. And you can't assign to this case the people you're about to fire because they're not very good engineers. 
unless you don't care about the outcome of this case. There's this big cost element about the focus of the people that you're representing, and they need to be focused on that piece of litigation very, very importantly. Thank you. Tell me this, Morgan, with dealing with a corporation, do you ever uh, discuss their expectations is what they think they can recover, assume that you're gonna be a plaintiff? And do you, have you ever been in a situation where you said that expectation's unreasonable? The, the answer is yes. We probably represent um, 50, in 50% 50 of our cases, plaintiffs, and in 50% of the cases, defendants. So it goes both ways. And uh, clients frequently know what they would like to, the outcome to be. And almost always, it's the optimal outcome. If you could draw a bell-shaped curve, it is that portion of the curve that's really, really small at one extreme of what the potential outcomes are. So we are always discussing what are the range of potential outcomes, what are the most likely outcomes, and quite importantly, when those outcomes will come to pass. Are we likely to win at summary judgment? No, we're unlikely to win at summary judgment. So in this particular court, you're in it for at least two and a half years. And then, because of the speed of the appellate courts, you have at least another year before it, the litigation comes to an end. So trying to get people's expectations to fit with reality is very important, very important at the outset of the case, and one needs to update it because new information comes in, the prospects might look brighter or bleaker over time. Judge, do you have any thoughts, Ms. Carlin, do you have any thoughts on counsel uh, having to deal with opposing counsel who may be troublesome or hard to work with, or uh, worst case scenario, uh, might have a reputation on an ethic code? Do you have any thoughts on best way that attorneys in this room should do that? You know, I, I think, um, I think you, uh, you start off by being a good person uh, yourself. Um, so one of the, one of, one of my early mentors uh, always told me that you should never fail to grant an opposing counsel's reasonable request for an accommodation, but you should never put yourself in a position where you need to ask for the accommodation. And um, so the, that, that sort of became a, um, something I wanted to live by as a lawyer. So um, I think if, if you start the relationship with an opposing counsel on a, a good note and you are a good person and you are easy to work with, um, you're more likely to get that in return. Um, but in terms of just dealing with, you know, it's, um, I guess I'll talk about it for a second from, from the bench side. Um, you know, it's a truism that uh, we want all counsel to get along perfectly and never come see us until the day of trial. Um, and we know that's not uh, going to happen uh, in some instances. And um, so um, I guess uh, what I would say is that um, you, you hold the trump card by going to the court uh, if you have to. And you can't use that phrase anymore, trump card. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That's right. <laughs> what card should I use? Uh, good point. Um, Mr. Chu, your objection is sustained. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I say that, you know, uh, we don't want everybody running to the court every time there's a disagreement, but um, I hope as a judge that I'm known as someone who will um, hopefully informally try to resolve those things. And so if you have a trial judge who will back you up, if you're being reasonable and the other side is, is not, um, that maybe that helps. I'd like to think that helps. Um, 
I think you should apply the Judge Melgren New York Times test uh, to your practice. And for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, um, this is an example of going to the judge when you can't get it done yourself. Um, so uh, there was an article called Judge Rules for Counsel saying baby comes first, and it was in the New York Times. And the fact pattern is two full months before trial, the defendant sought an extension of a Kansas City trial setting because one of its attorneys was expecting a child within two weeks of the trial date, and that attorney lived in Dallas. Opposing counsel who opposed the motion countered that the expectant father attorney likely knew of when his wife became pregnant uh, when the trial was first set and should have done the math at that time. Um, Judge Melgren was not amused um, and uh, declining to speculate on the time of conception um, ended his order with the comment, certainly this judge is convinced of the importance of federal court. Uh, but he's always tried not to confuse what he does with who he is, uh, nor to distort the priorities of his day job with his life's role. Counsel are encouraged to order their priorities. Similarly, defendant's motion is granted to extend the trial date and the parents to be are congratulated. Um, and so I will just say that, um, you know, I'm, I, I was a trial attorney for 22 years. There, uh, were very, very few attorneys um, who I ever had any problem with. Um, but uh, we all know in this room that there are a, a very few, and when you run into those people, um, uh, you know, judges weren't born yesterday. Um, if, if those attorneys have been in their court, they also know uh, it, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to be. Um, psychic uh, to know when a, an attorney is the one that's causing the problems. And so what I'm hearing a lot from today's panel and it's really interesting is how much uh, more I could be doing as a judge uh, to, uh, to help lawyers out. Um, so um, well, I'm glad we could help you on that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know that I answered your question, but I guess the, the, the big picture is that uh, if at the end of the day you can't get cooperation from someone, hopefully, you know, that's what the court, in this tiny few minuscule percentage of cases, is what we're for. Morgan, what is your usual standard of operation on opposing counsel who is either dealing unprofessionally with you or you and your client? How do you handle that from beginning to end, if you have some steps? It's really simple. We were human beings before we went to law school. Most of us, by the time we graduated from law school, were also still human beings. So I'm going to broaden out my answer. Let's say a younger lawyer in my office has acted improperly toward opposing counsel or toward staff. What do we want to have happen? We want that young lawyer to behave more professionally in the future to the staff, members of the staff, and to opposing counsel. So it's done privately. You never get a good outcome if you're chewing someone out in front of other people or yelling or uh, taking other punitive actions as opposed to taking Sally or Mike aside one-on-one -on -one saying, gee, here's what I saw and maybe next time you could do it this way. That also applies to opposing counsel who misbehaves. Judge Pierce. Well, it took me a little time to get here, but the way I handled opposing counsel, who was difficult, is um, I continue being reasonable. Uh, I continue doing all the things that I think are reasonable, and I don't react to the first light. I try to build up in my own mind, a, over time, a way of behaving so that at some point, if the lawyer doesn't change, I get to say to him or her, look, I've tried to act it I've tried to act reasonable throughout this process. You've, the, you've done these things. I've tried to respond reasonably. It seems to me you now should begin to behave better, and you need to do these things. Now, acting reasonably includes a lot of things, uh, returning phone calls, uh, even when the person's being ugly, being responsive reasonably in response to his or her request. But over time, I think if you build up a course of conduct where you've been reasonable, usually even the most disagreeable 
and I'll leave out the words, person on the other side will begin to change his or her conduct. Uh, I'd like to, Jim, you might get start getting ready on something in just a second. I would like to point out that in the materials there are two agreements and that these were proposed by Steve Sussman and he's had some cooperation with other people. One of them is called a trial agreement. And all it basically uh, that, and there's also a pretrial agreement, which is what he has proposed that if you would enter into, would be given to the court, and it would supersede the need to have a pretrial conference because the agreement of the uh, pretrial under the pretrial would be considered by the court. The court would adopt the same as this pretrial conference. If you practice in federal court under rule number one, there is additional language now that we as representative of parties are obligated to try to make it an expeditious flow of action and I think rule 26 has some uh, relevance to that as well. I would suggest that you read that. His problem has been and he pointed it out has been that if it came and I'm sure it would be for anyone in this room if you propose that and you've never talked to the other side about that they're going to say well, by God, this must be good for Hank Meyer, and it must be bad for me. And they'll say they don't agree to it. But there's some very, very good suggestions in there. And in addition to that, it's a shortening on the length and period of time on depositions. And I would like to ask the panel from Morgan, from left to right, on that. Morgan, do you have, at this time, do you think you take shorter depositions than you did 25 years ago? Absolutely. Well. There's tell us, tell us why. Uh, uh, and well, when I first started practicing law, I thought that I needed to learn everything from a deposition. It's not just the basic education which you can get from a witness in about 10 seconds. It was almost, where did he go to elementary school? And I was taught in an era when the goal was to find out every little piece of information because something, something might be helpful to us. But then after a while, when I started dealing with clients directly, I realized there's an expense to this. And so it all has to be proportional. And I think that's the greater driver, as well as sometimes uh, local rules and rules of a particular court. Yeah. <clears throat> um, when I was sitting as a trial judge, um, my first obligation, I thought, was to try to settle every case. And I used to ask lawyers when they come into my office, tell me, what's the theory of your, uh, what's your theory of liability in a civil case? And I was shocked at how many lawyers couldn't tell me. And the reason I said that, getting back to discovery and depositions, is a deposition plan, cases are tried on the elements of whatever it's about. It's negligence or whatever the particular case. And a, de a good deposition, I mean, once if you're trying to get uh, evidence, relates to one of those elements that you have to prove in order to make your case. So it seems to me if you've done a deposition plan and your purpose is to depose this witness to get information on an element, once you've got the evidence on the element, it seems to me your deposition should be over. And if you have a plan and you've planned it that way, you ought to be able to do it uh, efficiently and not be there all day. Jim, I think that what we need to ask you, and I know that you're, most of the people in here are familiar with the fact that Jim does primarily white collar criminal defense. And the question is that you're in court in Texas and that the federal judge says uh, it's the United States of America versus Billy Ray. They announce it's ready for trial. And the judge, of course, will turn over and look at the U.S. attorney and say, uh, uh, are we ready? And then he will look at Billy Ray's attorney and say, are you ready? How do you, under the, circ under the situation, under the, what is going on in this society today, how do you try to garner the trust and credibility with a jury in a criminal case. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry about that, Judge. I, I, I really am. Let, let me clean, clean this up. I, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> um, and with that, the young lawyer <laughs> up 
approached the podium and began voir dire. I saw that. I had been called for jury duty. I was thrilled. This is great. I'm going to get to see what it's like. The lawyer was having a breakfast bar. All 45 of us were sitting in the back of the courtroom waiting for things to get started. Knocked over a can of Coke. Went up and conducted her examination chewing gum the whole time. I'm not kidding. This is state court, by the way. I sat there and I was just amazed and I was kind of looking around at the other jurors and they were like, what's going on here? And one of the things that, I mean, those of you who have been trying cases, you know this, they're watching. Jurors are watching everything. They're fascinated. They've seen all this stuff on television, how lawyers work and operate. They're fascinated. They want to know, you know, can I, my gosh, he's putting his arm around his client. Does he like his client? Or, you know, he hasn't talked to his client for two days. They're watching. They're always watching, and you can't forget it, in the halls, driving to the courthouse, park in your car, they're watching because it's very important to them and they want to see a professional lawyer. In federal court, the last time I looked at the statistics, the U.S. Attorney's Office wins 93, 94% of the cases just for showing up. And, you know, if you think about it, it should be that way. Um, so, what do you do? You've got to somehow develop trust and credibility with the jury. Now, we are, our panel is the warm-up act for Dean Germaneski. I am here because Judy Clark uh, unfortunately couldn't make it and nobody replaces Judy Clark. She is uh, the top of the field. But you have to be, and what you learn from Judy Clark is you have to be honest. If there are weaknesses in your case, you've got to bring them out early on and explain them. Judy Clark's entire, well, yes, her entire career is representing Boston Marathon bomber, the Unabomber, the guy that shot uh, Representative uh, Gabby Gifford, the worst of the worst. And she's dedicated to fighting the death penalty. And her cases, she isn't arguing, did the person do it or not? She is trying to keep that person from being executed. That's what she is focused on. I was trying a federal death penalty case. The court asked me to get involved a few years ago. And it was alleged to be a contract for hire in a drug ring and my client was charged with the murder. He was charged with all sorts of drug crimes. And we made the decision. We weren't going to fight the drugs. We, we couldn't fight it. Opening statement, we tell the jury he's a drug dealer. He's been a drug dealer all of his life. And we're able to explain why that happened. So we just take that out of the case, and that's enough to get him a life sentence right there. So I'm getting up to argue in the guilt phase to the jury. Seated in the courtroom is Judy Clark. <coughs> she was in town uh, 
for a while she was in, involved in the uh, Lisa Montgomery case. This is the young lady that wanted to be pregnant and, and uh, literally did a C-section on a, on a poor woman uh, who bled to death and she took the baby and whatnot. But I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going to close the jury and Judy Clark is sitting there and I'm actually going to stand up here and argue my client isn't guilty of the murder. And I was petrified, absolutely petrified, because I'm thinking Judy Clark is going to think I'm the dumbest person on the face of the earth. I shouldn't even be here. But you've got to develop honesty and rapport and you've got to maintain that throughout the course of a trial, jurors know when you're trying to pull something over on them. It happens. Opening statements, you know, keep them short, brevity, right? Get to the point. I never say I believe the evidence will be such and such. I want to say it will be. And sometimes that's difficult to say in a criminal case, but you've got to figure out a way to do it. You've got to be yourself. You try to be somebody else. You know, we, we all go to these seminars and we get these clues about, uh, oh, here's a great argument, use it. And if it doesn't fit you, you can't do it. You simply can't do it. You're trying to get a jury to to say, yeah, there are two sides to this story. I have, a, I have a friend, Joe Matthews, I don't know if you know Joe or not, from a Florida fine trial lawyer. I couldn't do this, my life depended on it. He always says to juries, how many of you see my hand? And then eventually everyone holds up their hand. He said, can you all see my hand? They go, yeah. He says, no. You've seen the front of my hand. Here's the back of my hand. You haven't seen the whole hand. And then he goes on from there. I can't get away with that stuff. But it works for Joe. Um, but you do have to get a jury to understand there are two sides to a story. And I'm not going to bore you with another war story, but which I think is really great. <laughs> but I won't, I, won't, I won't go there. Be That's organized. Okay. If it's really good, yeah. Jim, tell them, no. for yeah, God's well, sakes. Don't okay. tease them. I, I will do that. All right. <laughs> Be organized. Jurors hate to see lawyers fumbling around, digging through the files. Be organized so that you can get your, your exhibits, uh, whatever you need, and be professional at all times. Be yourself. You've got to be yourself, unless you get the magic bullet. One of the very first seminars I went to as a young lawyer, one of the speakers was Harold Price Farringer. And Harold Price Farringer was a famous uh, First Amendment lawyer, famous plaintiff's lawyer, you know, great shock of white hair, and really looked the part. And he was talking about specific tips on argue, arguing to the jury. And he told this story about uh, beef stew. And I, and I thought to myself, I said, no, nah, I, I, I couldn't use that. That's not me. I, I forget about it. So I'm in a trial, um, federal court in Kansas City, Kansas. And we have shown that the main witness in the case lied, he admitted he lied, and everything else. The US, uh, assistant U.S. attorney gets up there and he's doing his closing argument, and he writes on the board the word lies. And he wants you know, the jury to um, see through that and look at the evidence and uh, you know, ignore the lies, basically what he's saying. So, bing, it's in my head, beef stew. And so, I, I say to the jury, 
We're talking about lies. And I, I, I said, you know, my dad and I, when it's cold out, we love to go to a diner. And we like to have beef stew. My dad loves beef stew, and he's taught me to love beef stew, too. And we went in one day, and the waiter brings out two bowls of beef stew. It smells great. And I stick my spoon in there, and I get my first chunk of meat, and it's rancid, and I spit it out. Well, what does my dad do? My dad doesn't say, well, keep fishing around in the beef stew until you get a good piece of meat. He says, and my father, no, he calls the waiter and says, waiter, get over here and bring us two good bowls of meat. And then the word lies is up there. And so I go over and I get an eraser and I erase the word lies and I say, you know, folks, lies have no place in a courtroom. Tell the government to go get some good witnesses, reliable testimony, and all that. I sat down and I thought, wow, did I really do that? I mean, did, that's not me. I'm pretty buttoned down. So what you want to know is, did it work? Right? The answer is, Yes, no, maybe. The jury sends out a note. Let's see, there are three defendants. We have a verdict on two and we're hung up on one. What do we do? So your friend, Judge Lee West, who was assigned the case because all the judges in the district had uh, recused themselves, he says, well, bring in the jury. So the jury comes in, Judge West says, I understand you have verdicts on two of the defendants, and you're hung up on one. And the foreman says, well, that's the way it was when we sent the note out. Now we're hung up on two, and we have a verdict on one. And I just knew it was my client that had flipped. So um, the judge discharges the jury. And he calls up the bench, and he looks at me, and he says, Jim, do not request a mistrial. And he says, I will be on the phone at 9 o'clock Monday morning. And he called and uh, granted my motion for judgment of acquittal and granted a uh, mistrial as to the uh, third person, and the case was never tried again. So, you know, if it doesn't I don't oh, know, I'm not going there. If it doesn't, if it's not you, you can't do it. And you have to pick the time that's right to do it. You can't do it in every case. But I think, you know, those are some of my thoughts on uh, garnering trust, garnering trust with the jury. But once you lose it, it's over, it's gone, and you never get it back. Judge Pierce, if we could, if you could address that same question on civil trials, and uh, if you could maybe give two or three points that should be taken out of this room today that each one of us should try to adopt. I'm sorry, what was the question? On civil trials, <laughs> if I'm you... I'm sorry. Okay. On civil trials, uh, you mean um, trust with the jury? Yes. Oh, I, I agree with what's being said. You obviously have to be yourself. Um, and you obviously want to be efficient, which is to say I, I definitely agree. You, you know, you, you want to be organized and all of that. But I think being yourself is a big thing. Um, it's not a play. Uh, it's not theater in the sense that you're acting. Somehow you have to allow your personality to come through. And, you know, we have all sorts of rules about how you should dress and all that. I'm pretty conservative when I'm in before a jury. Uh, I, I try not to be personally, any more than my personality is, personally distracting with, you know, how I appear. Uh, and then I try uh, to be myself. The other thing I, I think I've learned over the years is I, I use uh, notes less and less in the sense that I want to talk to people. Uh, in my opening statement, I don't use, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to meet a jury. Uh, in Massachusetts, just as an aside, we, uh, we had one of those weird things. Massachusetts, in every court, always followed what was essentially the federal rule on jury selection. 
So we were never permitted in the state courts, almost never, uh, to voir dire a jury. So all the stuff that uh, lawyers do and all the programs to tell you how to do it and all that stuff, in that sense, we were um, really at a disadvantage. And the judge, um, uh, as a judge actually from Oklahoma once said to me, uh, you know, when a, when, when a judge asks a question of a jury, all the judge wants to get is the answers that are necessary so that he or she can say, uh, you know, you're, you're gonna be in the box, but a judge isn't gonna be able to look a jury in the eye and see that the jury thinks that you're, as the judge said to me, a son of a bitch. <laughs> and that's what we lost in Massachusetts, so we never really developed that skill, but uh, you had to find other ways, uh, you know, to, to appear before a jury. And the funny thing is, I really thought that the opening statement for us was key we had to figure out a way to present ourselves in that opening statement in a way so that jurors may not like our side of the case, but I wanted the jury to believe that I was being honest about it. Uh, and over time, I, 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 just one story, uh, <clears throat> I had the uh, fortune or not of trying uh, a bunch of uh, eminent domain cases and I represented the taking authority, uh, which is never a good place to be. And so I, I started saying to the juries at the beginning, these were uh, big, big cases, and I said to the jury, look, I uh, had a younger partner with me and he almost had a heart attack. I said to the jury, look, I'm gonna tell you uh, what we've done and why our position is reasonable, and by the way, if you don't agree with us, because you know you could always say to the jury's number of domain cases, this is one of those rare cases where everybody walks away with money. Everybody understands that going in. But if you, and I told the jurors, if you don't agree with me, then give the plaintiff everything that they ask for. Uh, and I, I developed that because I thought, uh, by the way, I never thought the jury was gonna do that. Uh, but I was really trying to say, present myself in a way that I was gonna be honest with them. Um, uh, it worked out pretty good. I don't necessarily recommend it. Certainly the young lawyer with me didn't think it was a good idea. But, but it did work for me, and I think the only thing I'm trying to say here is, uh, so that I don't be too redundant, is talking to jurors, presenting yourself in a way so that uh, you, they think that you're honest. They may not agree with you at the end, but at least sometimes people come up to you afterwards, as, as has happened to me, unfortunately, a few times. I'm sorry we couldn't rule for you, but uh, you made a nice presentation. We really liked you. Morgan, uh, if you could answer that, but I would like you to answer two other questions. I want you to assume that 60 Minutes, CBS, has spent an awful lot of money in trying to be able to find out the length of period of time for the consciousness of an American citizen, and they think it's around 20 minutes, that if it's over that, then they're gonna lose the audience. Number two on that question, do you try to limit your openings to 20, 20 minutes, or do you, do, you, do you believe in that, or do you, are you willing to go for longer than that? So let, let me start with that, and then yes, sir. I'll work in uh, the other issues that were being addressed. One of my great failings, or, and in fact, there are so many great failings, but I'm just going to focus on one of them now, is I intend to be really short, short on cross-examination, short on direct examination to get to the core of the issues. And I'm always much longer than what I want to be. I know that's a failing I have, so I really have to work at it. I think it's far better that the opening be incredibly short, much less than 20 minutes, and certainly not an hour and a half. It's common sense. It's not just what studies have shown. Think about when you're listening to someone else, how your mind begins to wander. And even sometimes with friends, you take out your, your smartphone and you begin scrolling and shopping and buying tickets and things like that. So here's advice. Two really quick, easy ones, and then I'll tell you a story about a real trial. The advice all has to do with common sense. But I also realize that one of my other failings is that I have blind spots in common sense. So true story, I'm a young lawyer, out of town trial, but I'm gonna be the lead counsel. The local counsel is known to everyone in the courthouse. He 
He knows every court clerk, all the staff. He knows the custodial people. And the trial starts. He's, he's a veteran. He has sound advice. After the first day, he says, Morgan, you need to polish your shoes. I said, what are you talking about? I never polish my shoes. He says, half the jurors will notice that your shoes aren't polished. And after that, whenever, for, for some number of trials, when we're permitted to interview the jurors after we go through all the substantive questions, I will ask the jurors whether they notice anything about shoes, of the lawyers. All of the women <laughs> jurors notice. They notice the shoes of the men lawyers and the women lawyers. None of the male jurors notice anything about the shoes. So oh, all the male jurors had my blind spot, right? They didn't know that they're supposed to polish their shoes. Another quick story has to do with uh, this occurred in a real case. Opposing counsel goes to the overhead projector. Remember those things? You put a piece of paper down, it projects it up. And of course, when you're putting down a document, your hand shows up and it's projected. And she had gotten married recently. And she had received as a wedding ring something that looked like the Hope Diamond. <laughs> and this was so big, it was unimaginable. And then when it's blown up on the screen, it looks gigantic. So she had a blind spot for her common sense. So here's a substantive example. True case. Um, November 1979 was when there were thousands of people in Tehran and they overran the American embassy. They took everyone hostage. And as you may know, most of them were kept as hostages for 444 days. A couple enterprising reporters did some investigative reporting, and they found out that one of the hostages, and only one, was a private US citizen. All the rest were Marines providing security or employees of the federal government. And they did further investigation and found out that he had had some drug convictions, spent time in, in prison, had a really checkered background. But they realized that if they published the story, he would be sure to die. Because in Iran, as is the case in a good number of other countries, there's such a hatred for drugs that it will they would mete out the death penalty in a summary fashion. So they hold the story. The, uh, upon inauguration of the new president, it was moving from President Carter to President Reagan, the Iranians uh, released the hostages. So then the newspaper publishes a story about Jerry Plotkin, who was the private citizen, and it talks about his criminal background. He promptly sues for uh, invasion of the right to privacy, and uh, also for libel and other grounds. Then what happens is that the publisher, which is the Tribune Company, decides, probably the first time since John Peter Zenger, to order the reporters to reveal their confidential sources because they were going to have their initial public offering that was a multi-billion dollar public offering. At that point, the publisher decides, well, there's a conflict with the reporters, and the lead reporter hires me. I'm a real young lawyer at the time. Two very senior people, one representing the publisher, one representing the other reporter. So one day, opposing counsel says, well, we have a new witness, which means surprise witness. <laughs> oh, who is that? It's the Archbishop of Detroit. You may remember that at Christmas, uh, three well-known clergy went to visit the hostages. William Sloan Coffin, who was the chaplain at Yale, the Archbishop of Detroit. And here's what the direct examination is, in essence. You visited Jerry Plotkin. And why are we hearing this testimony? because Jerry Plotkin had made a videotape 
that said, bring the Shah home. And we said that that made Jerry Plotkin a public figure for First Amendment purposes. So a higher burden of proof, a different standard of proof for libel. So the archbishop testifies that when he visited Jerry Plotkin, he was beaten up, he was blindfolded, he was in a cold, damp cell, his captors had AK-47s, that he had been punished physically day after day, sometimes hour after hour. So this could not be a voluntary statement, and therefore he did not purposely inject himself into the public debate, and therefore he wasn't a public figure. Direct examination ends. The other two lawyers for the other two parties, the most senior person, they're both members of the American College of Trial Lawyers, looks directly at me and says, I don't have any questions on Cross. The second lawyer, also great veteran, looks directly at me and says, Morgan, I don't have any questions on Cross. <laughs> well, because I was young and stupid, I start to get up, they stop me, they say, are you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> so here's the cross-examination. Did you visit other hostages? Yes. I understand you visited Corporal Thomas Jones, who's in the Marine Corps, yes. Was he in solitary confinement? Yes. Was he beat up? Yes. Was he tortured? Yes. Were there AK-47? And did you visit with so-and-so who's the first secretary of the embassy? Yes. And did you visit with this next person and this next person and this next person, all civilians, all treated in the same way? And to your knowledge, did any one of them make a statement that was broadcast worldwide to bring the Shah home? My point is that it's common sense and it's common sense that, of course, these hostages across the board were very poorly treated, but no one else had decided to make those public statements. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got very few minutes left, so I'd stand up. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to direct to any member or individual or the panelists? So, well, then, if you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Judge. If you just have one piece of advice to give to young lawyers particularly who are getting started in their careers, what would that one piece of advice be? Judge Carlin. If you could start. Well, don't make me go first. Um, Is uh, that the advice? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's very good just, advice. Uh, <coughs> I, um, I think uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You might just uh, be a good person and uh, remember what you were before you went to law school. Work hard. I would say be passionate about what you do. To be good, you have to really work hard, but smell the flowers along the way. Oh, and I would add, and wear a bow tie because it's easier to bend down and smell the flowers. <laughs> or no tie. Do Judge Pierce. Do I have to follow that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, just what I said at the beginning, I think you're, think about your personal reputation and keep that in mind throughout everything you do for your entire career. And I think you'll be in pretty good shape. Jim. Uh, your word is your bond. That simple. I'll uh, leave it with one story that'll go with an unnamed on professionalism, and it was, had to do with a fairly large, significant case that was filed, and I was sitting at home. It was night before I was going to file it, and I, rep, uh, I was kind of mumbling around, and this human being on the other side that lived in this state was going to be affected by the filing. And so I picked up the phone and I placed a call as much as I didn't want to. And that gentleman said, was chatty Cathy a little bit. And I said, this is about business. I said, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., 
I'm going to file a petition in Cleveland County District Court, which is Norman, Oklahoma. And I said, one of those defendants will be your law firm. I will never forget his response. He said, I guess we will never talk about that subject again. And the moral of the story is, today we are still very, very close friends. And um, I appreciate his professionalism, and I think I was right to call. So I hope that we've been able to give you some insight um, into these things, and I appreciate everything the panel did, the trouble that they went to, and being able to put up with two bow ties on this podium today. Thank you very, very much.